Yamasee in Georgia and the Seminoles in Florida, the Shinnecocks, Cherokee, and Tuscarora all provided sanctuary for escaping slaves. This was not charity, it was business. Africans had learned English, were familiar with white ways, and were more than willing to scout and fight in raids on European settlers in their plantations in the Carolinas. It was an important and pivotal alliance, but exactly how many former slaves took this southern route to freedom is lost to history. The number of slaves who allied with Native Americans in the 17th and 18th centuries may be unknown, but many of their descendants still live with the tribes they joined more than 300 years ago. In fact, on the General Council of the Seminole Nation today, three seats are held by African Seminoles who are still referred to as Seminole freedmen. To know that there's still African American families in this country who can trace their genealogies back even before the founding of this country is mind-blowing. Underground Railroad. Do you imagine a train rolling north along underground rails? Do you see poor, shivering slaves being led through trap doors and dark tunnels? Well, if that is what you see, you see the myth. Because the real Underground Railroad was neither underground nor was it a railroad. Instead, Underground Railroad is a symbolic name for the 200-year-long struggle to break free from slavery in America. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. The average escapee started the journey on his or her own and were helped along the way in all kinds of unexpected ways, mainly by strangers. Think about the difficulty of making an escape. I mean, if you're a fugitive slave, there are no maps that you can use. Your knowledge of areas outside the plantation generally not very great. There is danger at every turn. And of course, you didn't want to fail because the consequences of failing could be unthinkable. It was especially difficult for women to make this decision. After all, women having charged the children had additional burden. I mean, it doesn't take great imagination to understand how difficult it is to try to escape with an infant. She felt that she had rather be drowned than to be captured and separated from her child, and nerved with a strength such as God gives only to the desperate. With one wild cry and flying leap, she vaulted over the turbid current. The seeds of the Underground Railroad were sown in 1526, when Spanish settlers brought the first indented servants from Africa to the North American mainland, at what would become Sapelo Sound, Georgia. In 1619, 100 Africans were shipped to Jamestown. Only 20 survived the trip to serve in the brand new British colony called Virginia. And as a new nation was born, so too was a thriving slave trade. Negroes for sale, a cargo of very fine stout men and women in good order and fit for immediate service. Conditions are one half cash or produce, the other half due January next. Plantation owners deeply believed that slavery was an economic necessity and that the slave trade was its human stock market. Unconditional submission was the enslaved African's fate. To disobey or run away was to sign your own death warrant. We teach them they are slaves and to the white face belongs control and to the black obedience. Plantation owner, 1820. How I hated slavery, as it fettered me and beat me and baffled me in my desires. In my period of despair, it gave me the power to hate. But in the end, it also gave me the will and the courage to conquer or die. John P. Parker, former slave, 1845. Don't forget that slavery, theoretically, in its purest form, 
is absolute power of one person over another person. I don't have to tell you what horrible possibilities that conjures up. Life for enslaved Africans during slave time was like hell. Uh, there's no way that we can romanticize it or minimize it. Never having that free will to even think or do for yourself. I, I can't even fathom what that life would be like to be relegated to boy all of your life until you became so old that you couldn't work. So what manner of people are we? What manner of people are our ancestors that they could endure and hope and pray and struggle that a better day would come? Slavery is at the core of what America is. You take slavery out of the American experience, you don't have America. Slavery is quintessentially a shaper of American culture and American expectations. To see fathers and husbands sold away, to be beat, raped daily, to be murdered in the hills and valleys of the southern parts of America, they yearn for a better day. They were fed up. My great-great-grandfather was one of those people, fed up, and he knew that he had to take his own freedom. So what choice was there? We think of the route to freedom as running in one direction, running from the south to the north. But it's important to remember that in the 1600s and 1700s before the Revolutionary War, slavery was legal in all 13 colonies and in Canada. And a runaway slave was just as likely to be recaptured or killed in the north as in the south. Right here in the heart of Philadelphia, the so-called city of brotherly love, they sold slaves on auction blocks. There were slaves in Boston. There were slaves in New York City. There were slaves in New Jersey. There were slaves in all through New England. We were programmed early in our schools that all slavery occurred in the South. That isn't true. So for the earliest pioneers of the Underground Railroad, there were very few options. One was to run off into the vast tracts of unexplored land to the West, a journey almost certainly doomed to failure. Another was to flee south into Spanish Florida, Mexico, or the Caribbean. And it was along this route south in the 1600s and 1700s that enslaved Africans found their best and most unlikely allies. The Yamasee in Georgia and the Seminoles in Florida, the Shinnecocks, Cherokee, and Tuscarora all provided sanctuary for escaping slaves. This was not charity. It was business. Africans had learned English, were familiar with white ways, and were more than willing to scout and fight in raids on European settlers and their plantations in the Carolinas. It was an important and pivotal alliance, but exactly how many former slaves took this southern route to freedom is lost to history. The number of slaves who allied with Native Americans in the 17th and 18th centuries may be unknown, but many of their descendants still live with the tribes they joined more than 300 years ago. In fact, on the General Council of the Seminole Nation today, three seats are held by African Seminoles who are still referred to as Seminole freedmen. To know that there's still African American families in this country who can trace their genealogies back even before the founding of this country is mind-blowing. Referred to on English maps as Fort Mosa, this was the first legally sanctioned free black community in North America. The settlement was abandoned after Spain ceded Florida to the United States. Fort Mosa would have been lost to history forever if not for this photograph. This is thermal imaging from the space shuttle Atlantis, revealing the original foundations of the Fort Mosa settlement sunk into swampland. Today, Fort Mosa is a national historic landmark. The free African settlers at Fort Mosa may have been the first, but they were by no means the last. To the north, the number of free Africans was slowly increasing. 
In the 1600s, European ship crews included Africans who chose to stay in North America and raise a family. And there were some enslaved Africans early on who were able to slip through the net of slave law. In the 1700s, these freedmen, as they were called, the most minor of all minorities, began to grow through births, freeing by masters, self-purchase, and successful escapes. And from the very beginning, these men and women actively worked for the cause of freedom and the abolition of slavery. In 1769, freedmen joined both sides of what was becoming the War of Independence. Many joined with the American revolutionaries, including Crispus Attucks, a former slave who was killed by British redcoats in the Boston Massacre of 1770. But others sided with the Tories and the British troops. When African Americans fought in the Revolutionary War, think about it here, they fought for a slaveholding nation. Whether they fought for the British, slaveholding nation, or the Americans, slaveholding nation. They didn't fight for slavery. They fought because they thought that the result of that fight would end in freedom. And economics dictated that slavery would become concentrated in the South, where cotton was king. Slavery was critical to the Southern economy. It was also critical to the power, political power structure of the South. You know, by 1840, cotton was the most valuable export of this nation, not of the South, of this nation. By 1840, it was more valuable than every single thing this nation exported put together. That's power for you. And as slavery became concentrated in the South, the small numbers of free blacks who had been spread out across the United States began to concentrate in the North. And in the North, the freedmen quickly became vocal activists for the abolition of slavery. They are pushing hardest for America to live up to the sacred words of its documents, of its declaration, of its preamble, of its Bill of Rights. These are the people who are saying to America, if you say it, do it. The Underground Railroad and those people who participate in it tried to make it very uncomfortable for us to be hypocritical. And they succeeded. By 1786, 14 northern states and territories had abolished slavery or legislated gradual emancipation. The boundary between the free states of the north and the slave states of the south came to be known as the Mason-Dixon Line, named for the men who originally surveyed the Maryland-Pennsylvania border. So by the beginning of the 1800s, crossing this line became the goal for most slaves seeking freedom. By word of mouth, through song and story, slaves began to learn that there was a new place where they might find sanctuary and freedom. It was called the North. But where was the North and how did you get there? Imagine yourself a slave on a Carolina plantation, illiterate, undernourished, without a map or even the simplest directions. Which way do you run? And how do you know friend from foe along the way? For the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. According to legend, Follow the Drinking Gourd was written by a southern free black carpenter known only as Peg Leg Joe. The lyrics seem simple, but they contain secret instructions for a safe escape route north. The Drinking Gourd was the Big Dipper, and to follow the Drinking Gourd meant to walk at night under cover of darkness, keeping the North Star in sight. Dead trees show you the way. The line, the dead trees will show you the way, referred to dead trees along the Tom Bigby River. Left foot, peg foot, 
traveling along. And left foot peg foot traveling on refer to trees that had been marked with charcoal and mud drawings of a peg leg and a foot leading runaway slaves north into Tennessee. And with every slave who attempted to escape, over time, slaves and those who harbored them came to know this song and a whole lexicon of secret signs and symbols, songs and hiding places that began to make up the disparate lines of the Underground Railroad. Frederick Douglass was the son of a slave and her white master. Secretly, Douglass taught himself to read and write, which was in itself a serious crime. Then, in 1838, around the age of 21, Douglass fled from slavery in Maryland to New Bedford, Massachusetts. In 1841, he went to William Lord Garrison's convention as a spectator. Emboldened by the anti-slavery rhetoric, Frederick Douglass stood up before the enormous crowd and extemporaneously delivered one of the greatest speeches in American history. The speech was never written down, and we have only William Lloyd Garrison's memory of it to help us imagine what that incredible moment must have been like. I shall never forget his first speech at the convention. In physical proportion and stature commanding, in intellect richly endowed, in eloquence a prodigy, and yet a slave, a fugitive slave, trembling for his safety, hardly daring to believe that on the American soil a single white person would befriend him. The powerful impression he created, the applause which followed excited my emotions, and I think I never hated slavery so intensely as at that moment. William Lloyd Garrison, 1841. It's almost impossible to, to exaggerate the importance of this man to the movement. Frederick Douglass telling his story brings slavery alive to people who had, in many cases, never even seen a black person before. And so here is a black person who was a slave standing before you telling you his story. And he's telling you about the atrocities of slavery. He's telling you about how slavery denies basic human freedom to people and human dignity to people. That was a moving message. The wife of Master Giles Hicks with her own hands murdered my wife's cousin, a young girl between 15 and 16 years of age, mutilating her person in the most shocking manner. The atrocious woman in the paroxysm of her wrath, not content with murdering her victim, literally mangled her face and broke her breastbone. So I say, the only true remedy for the extension of slavery is the immediate abolition of slavery. Frederick Douglass, 1845. Douglass went on to write his autobiography and published an anti-slavery newspaper, The North Star. He helped dozens of fugitives to freedom, many of whom simply appeared at his doorstep in Rochester, New York. But while Douglas's home was an unofficial station along the Underground Railroad, his greatest contribution to the movement was the leadership he inspired in others. Conductors along the route whose names are lost in obscurity, but who are no less important in the history of the Underground Railroad. When historian Charles Bloxon was 10 years old, his grandfather began to sing songs and tell stories about his family. His grandfather, James Bloxon, and his cousin, Jacob Bloxon, had been slaves who'd run away underground. But like thousands of others who'd fled north along invisible rails, the Bloxons had kept the secrets of the Underground Railroad locked in their hearts until they died. Years later, when Charles was a grown man with a family of his own, he was in a used bookshop in Philadelphia where a ragged old book caught his eye. The cover was torn. I had it rebound since. It said Underground Railroad. And I opened the book up, and there was a portrait of William Steele. And lo and behold, I, the next page I opened to was 488. And I was thunderstruck when I read that arriving from Sussex County 
Delaware in 1858, Jacob Bloxham, George Ellagood, Jim Ellagood, and George Lewis. They arrived and he told their story to William Still. The author, William Still, was one of the most tireless workers on the Underground Railroad. Nearly forgotten today, between 1840 and 1861, Still and his family harbored more than 2,700 runaway slaves at their home in Philadelphia. Working with whites and free blacks from Florida to Canada, Still developed a loose network of friends who would assist fugitive slaves by foot, cart, and ship. He kept rare day-by-day -day records of his activities. He wrote down the personal narratives of hundreds of fugitive slaves. He copied out letters for runaways who were trying to get word to wives and children left behind. And he then arranged to have those letters smuggled to the South. Dear wife, I now inform you I am in Canada and am well, and hope you are the same, and wish you to be here next August. I am doing well working for a butcher, and will get good wages in the spring. I now get $2.50 a week. I expect you, my wife Leanne, and our sons Alexander and Louis and Ames will all be here soon, and Isabella also. If you can't bring all, bring Alexander surely. Right when, when you will, will come. come and I will meet you in Albany. Love to you from your loving husband, Jacob. So this is my family, documented by William Steele. I felt like a bolt of lightning just struck me. You know, I couldn't move. I, I was broke out in sweat because here documented in this book, this classic, was James Bloxon, and later he talks about Jim Bloxon, the same James Bloxon that my grandfather, his father, was singing about, and I at the age of 10 years old. It was like deja vu. All that went around came around. And William Still's personal story is no less remarkable. William was a freeborn black, but his mother, Charity, was an escaped slave. Before William was born, Charity worked on a Maryland plantation and had two sons, Peter and Levin. She tries to escape with her children. She fails. She is brought back. And uh, after a long time, she determines that she's got to escape, but this time she makes the decision to escape and leave her children behind. Can you imagine what a decision that is for a mother to make? So she, she strikes out, she leaves her children with her mother, who is also a slave on the same plantation. And Peter, being only six, he, he, was, he was crying for his mama, Granny, I want my mama. Well, Peter? There's a place not far from here called Philadelphia. Can you say Philadelphia, Peter? <laughs> I, 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 I could say Philadelphia, Granny. Well, Peter, when you get down there where they taking you, mayhap you find a white man you could trust. And you tell him you got stole from your mama from a place called Philadelphia. In a paroxysm of rage, Charity's master took the two boys away from their grandmother and sold them to another slaveholder in Mississippi, literally selling Peter and Levin down the river. Thirty years later, a man, frightened and weary, walks into William Still's office at the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society in Philadelphia. He's looking for his mama. Her name is Charity. His name is Peter. Later, William Still would write of this amazing reunion. After traveling 1,600 miles, almost the first man whom Peter sought advice from was his own brother, whom he had never seen or heard of. He was my long-lost brother, whose history and fate had been enveloped in sadness so long, and for whom mother had shed so many tears. <laughs>
Peter and William hatched a plan to rescue Peter's wife and children still enslaved. During the daring rescue attempt, one of Still's compatriots, a white conductor named Seth Conklin, was killed, and Peter and his family were all returned to slavery. Letter to slave master B. McKiernan from William Still. Now, sir, allow me to make an appeal to your humanity. Although we are aware of your power to hold as property those poor slaves, your present humble correspondent is the youngest of Peter's brothers and the first one he saw in arriving in this part of the country. As regards the price fixed upon by you for the family, I must say I do not think it is possible to raise half that amount. But, sir, will the money be as great a benefit to you as the satisfaction you will find in bestowing so great a favor upon those whose entire happiness in this life depends upon your decision in the matter? Your obedient servant, William Still. August 1851. No reply to this letter was ever received from Master McKiernan. It was an Underground Railroad fairy tale, without the part where they live happily ever after. This is the real Underground Railroad, a mammoth, dangerous struggle for freedom that failed as often as it succeeded. But the passengers and the conductors along the line were undaunted. They persevered and began to come up with ingenious escape plans. Desperate measures called for by desperate times. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was without a doubt unconstitutional. There were many clauses in that law that were so favorable to the South that freebooters, both North and South, took advantage of it and kidnapped free Negroes and sold them into slavery. In the state of Illinois, bordering on the Ohio River, nearly all the free Negroes were kidnapped and sold into slavery by 1851. Illinois Senator Shelby M. Cullen. Now the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was a needed law, for the penalty attached to that law was all the hope the slaveholders had of ever recapturing their fugitive slaves. A.P. Stewart, General of the Confederacy. The Fugitive Slave Law in 1850 called upon non-slaves, black and white, to help in the return and the capture of fugitives. If a man is walking down the street and uh, a fugitive runs by and slave catchers are chasing this fugitive, that man can be deputized on the spot and the person would be forced to help in the return of that fugitive under penalty of fine and imprisonment. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was extremely effective in large part because it was so harsh. The Northern United States was no longer a safe haven for escaped slaves. And so the Underground Railroad had to expand all the way into Canada, where slavery had been abolished more than 100 years before. Throughout Ontario, the Canadian government and American abolitionists funded black settlements with free housing and farmland. Canada was certainly not free from racism, but here, in 1850, fugitive slaves could own businesses, expect fair treatment in court, and most importantly, they had the right to vote. By the end of the Civil War, more than 20,000 African Americans had resettled in Canada. But getting to Canada was getting tricky. And in 1850, William and Ellen Craft were caught in the crossfire of the Fugitive Slave Act. They had reached Boston and were immediately sent into hiding. They were hidden in the home of Lewis Hayden, a former fugitive slave who, with his wife, Harriet, had provided a refuge for hundreds of escaping slaves. The Fugitive Slave Law came literally to their front door. Slave catchers come to town. Lewis Hayden piles kegs of gunpowder on his front porch, and he stands there with a torch, and he says, you will not take a slave from this building. And he threatens to blow everybody up, including the slave and the slave catchers, and himself up, before he will allow the slave to be taken. He discourages the slave, the slave catchers. Other blacks show up, and eventually these uh, catchers of slaves leave the city. While the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 resulted in the unjust capture and death 
of countless African Americans. Ironically, it also had positive effects its legislators had never intended. Many people in the North, who had cared little about slavery until then, turned against it. It re-energized and led to the expansion of Underground Railroad routes, and it inspired one woman to lay her life on the line again and again for the cause of freedom. That woman was Harriet Tubman. Come on up, come on up, I've got a lifeline. Come on up to this train of mine. She said her name was Harriet Tubman, and she drove for the underground railroad. Harriet Tubman was born a slave in Bucktown, Maryland. She was one of 11 children, and she was beaten daily because they wanted to break her spirit. She, went, she was never a submissive child. She was a spitfire, they called her. At the age of five and six years old, anything that she did wrong, they would beat her with lashes across her face, her neck, and her back. And when children are supposed to be playing, this little girl was being beaten to break her spirit. As a teenager, Harriet tried twice to flee with her brothers, but both attempts were unsuccessful. The next time I go, Harriet vowed, I'm going to go alone. She had a prize quilt, and she traded her quilt in for information about the Underground Railroad. And she struck out for freedom in the summer of 1849. She had vowed, she said, there was one of two things I have a right to, liberty or death. If I can have one, I will have the other. No man shall take me alive. I will fight for my liberty. And when the time comes for me to go, only the Lord will let them kill me. As so many before her had done, Harriet set out with no plan or destination, only to follow the drinking gourd, the North Star, to freedom. The route through Eastern Maryland was treacherous, filled with armed patrols on horseback and bloodhounds. Placards advertising rewards for the capture of runaway slaves were posted at every tavern and crossroads. But Harriet persevered and arrived in Philadelphia. I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person now I was free. There was such a glory over everything. I felt like I was in heaven. Harriet Tubman. Her freedom was just not enough for her. She thought about her, her friends. She thought about her other relatives. And so she vowed to go back. She had the name of Moses. Because of her ventures of going back repeatedly into slave territory. From 1850 to the outbreak of civil war, Harriet Tubman returned south some 19 times to personally conduct as many as 300 fugitives, including her own mother and father and those brothers who had tried twice and failed. Again and again, Harriet went back through the eastern shore of Maryland, through the Great Dismal Swamp, across the Delaware River, and 500 miles more into St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, where the runaways would be safe. So great was her courage, so triumphant her success, that planters in Maryland offered a $40,000 reward for her capture the highest bounty ever offered for any worker on the Underground Railroad. And to never have been captured? She often boasted, I've never ran my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. And that was true. Things were changing on the Underground Railroad. Many of the fugitive slaves who had settled in the North went on to have children, and those children could be educated in the public school systems. With this burgeoning literate class, the written word began to replace the old codes and signals. But getting word back south was hard. 
Slaves were not allowed to receive or send letters by post or to assemble freely outside of church services on Sunday. So black churches, by necessity, became the unofficial post offices of the Underground Railroad, and black sailors became the mail carriers. Do you realize that Charleston actually imprisoned black sailors when they came to port for the time they were in port so that they would not provide messages to free blacks in the city or to slaves in the city? But with the help of the churches, messages did get through. In 1992, historian James Horton found a bundle of old letters still hidden in a church vault. They were letters from an escaped slave who was living in Ohio, written to her mother who was still enslaved in Louisiana. The letters traced the young runaway's life. So when she got married, she wrote to her mother, taught, telling her about this man that she was going to marry. And when she had a child, she wrote to her mother, telling her mother about this child. And the last letter that I saw that she had written to her mother was telling her mother that this child had grown to late teenage and was about to enroll in Oberlin Collegiate Institute. And so we have this grandmother in a slave hut reading about her grandson about to enroll in college. Oberlin Collegiate Institute in Oberlin, Ohio is still in operation today. It was America's first integrated co-educational college. Oberlin turned out some of America's first black lawyers, doctors, writers, and artists, almost all of whom were descendants of fugitive slaves. Why Oberlin? Well, why not, the citizens of Oberlin would answer. Because of its strong Quaker, free black, and abolitionist populations, the entire town of Oberlin was, in effect, an underground railroad station. Fugitive slaves had lived there for 50 years with little threat from slave catchers and kidnappers. But the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that had so changed the Underground Railroad in the East was also reaching into the Midwest. And when it hit Oberlin, it exploded. It's estimated that the federal government spent anywhere between $20,000 and $100,000 to bring one fugitive slave out of Boston. He was later sold for $962 at auction. The Anthony Burns rescue, uh, or attempted rescue, and his return becomes, I think, a pivotal moment in the anti-slavery movement because I think it makes the point that slavery happens to real people. And then, in 1857, at the trial of fugitive slave Dred Scott, all those real people are dealt the severest blow of all. Chief Justice R.B. Tawney hands down his decision in the Dred Scott case, reducing all slaves to nothing more than property. The Negroes have never been, will not, and cannot be citizens of the United States. They have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Chief Justice R.B. Taney, 1857. In one fell swoop, all the work that had been done on the Underground Railroad was about to be undone in the eyes of the law. Tawney is also worried that in the North, some blacks are getting complete equality. There are black voters in a handful of New England states. There have already been a couple of black elected officials in New England. When Anthony Burns had been seized in Boston in 1854, the lead attorney was Richard Henry Dana, who was a white man most noted for writing the book two years before the mast. But sitting behind Dana, helping him, was a young black attorney. I think that Tawney truly believed that blacks had only one place in American society, and that was as slaves. He did not like free blacks. He did not want free blacks in his world. At the national level, there was going to be no aid, no assistance, no recourse, and no place to go for blacks. It, in, it upped the ante. It intensified the situation enormously. And for them to be told that after doing every single thing you expect a good citizen to do, that you are not a citizen, you're talking anger here. People were just furious. Charles Lennox Ramon stands up and says, we owe no allegiance 
to a country that grinds us under its iron heel and treats us like dogs. The time has gone by for the black man to speak of patriotism. We are talking about really angry people. The beginning of the end came with the first battles of the Civil War. It was not the first time blacks would choose up sides in a battle for freedom on American soil, but it was the first time they would win. I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free and that the executive government of the United States including the military and naval authorities thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. Abraham Lincoln. After the outbreak of civil war and particularly after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, the Underground Railroad shifted its focus. Abolition societies and vigilance committees became relief organizations, collecting funds, food, and clothing for the legions of African Americans who were now finally free. In some ways, the real work had just begun, and it continues to this day. Harriet Tubman served as a nurse, scout, and Union Army spy during the Civil War and continued to fight for black education and women's suffrage until her death at the age of 93. Close to the end of her life, Harriet was reunited with some of the former slaves she had helped rescue. As she was dying, about two hours before her death, she was conscious, and they were singing, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming for to carry me home. She died March 10th, 1913. She was buried with military rights at Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York. Frederick Douglass continued to speak and write for equality and eventually served as U.S. Marshal of the District of Columbia and then U.S. Minister to Haiti. After a lifetime of hard work, John P. Parker lost his business to an arson fire and wrote it into his will that he would disinherit any child who went into the family business. All six Parker children became educators. His son, Cassius Clay Parker, rising to superintendent of the St. Louis public school system. William Still published his personal diaries as the Underground Railroad in 1872. He died in 1902 and was buried in Philadelphia's African American Cemetery. The New York Times called him the father of the Underground Railroad when he died. This was a man who had one year and one month of formal education. So don't tell me, life is so hard, it stands in my way. You have to claim, you have to follow that star, reach for that star, just as our ancestors did. That's my message not just to our still children, not just to African-American children, but to every young person in America and really in the world. not have been secret tunnels crisscrossing America or ghost trains that ran in the dead of night. But the real story of the Underground Railroad is so much better. It's so much bigger than those old myths we grew up with. The history of the Underground Railroad is the history of America and shows us what we are capable of accomplishing in the name of freedom, no matter what obstacles may stand in the way. <laughs>